Today, in Israel, at any hour of daylight, it is almost impossible to look up and not see the vapor trail of at least one jet fighter streaking across the sky. And at night, although unseen, they are there, defending their land. The Israeli Air Force. The Air Force that in five hours in 1967 flew west to first destroy the Egyptian Air Force and then, refueled and rearmed, turned east to decimate the Syrian Air Force. The Air Force whose skill and daring captured the imagination of the entire world in 1976 with the rescue of 101 hostages at Entebbe. The Air Force that in 1981 flew 650 miles across totally hostile ground to Baghdad to smash the Iraqi nuclear reactor. And in the course of a few days in 1982, destroyed 78 Syrian fighters without the loss of a single Israeli aircraft. The Air Force whose requirements are so stringent that only one cadet in ten receives the coveted silver wings. The Air Force that today is unarguably the world's finest. And this is the same Air Force that in May of 1948, one week before the founding of the State of Israel, awaiting the onslaught of the invading armies of five Arab nations, did not possess a single fighter plane or bomber. These were its aircraft, its only aircraft. And these were its pilots, incredibly courageous young Israelis facing an enemy equipped with the most modern of fighter and bomber aircraft, an enemy sworn to throw the Jews into the sea. But help was on the way. From America and South Africa and Canada and England, they flew their ancient war-weary transports across the oceans to the new nation. They brought men and munitions and spare parts. They brought life, sometimes at the cost of their own. Who were these men? These volunteers who created literally from nothing the Air Force that today is so respected by its peers and feared by its enemies. These men of whom a grateful nation said they were all we had. Who were they? This is their story. In the fall of 1947, I was contacted by uh, some people of the Jewish community. They told me that uh, there were people from Palestine who later on turned out to be Haganah that were looking for someone, a Jew, an American Jew, who was involved in aviation. There was no Israeli Air Force except the little Piper Cubs. We were a total of, uh, as I remember, nine pilots. Uh, in the whole Air Force and maybe another half a dozen people on the ground. We used to carry the bombs on our laps in uh, small aircraft like uh, uh, Oster, Tiger, uh, Tiger Moth and that sort of thing. We used to uh, carry them on our lap and we used to throw them uh, out of the window. I mean, that was our Air Force at the time. I made contact with all of those uh, people that I had known or did know in the aviation world that I thought could be useful. The name Al Schwimmer came to my mind as a fellow who flew with me in TWA, a flight engineer, very competent. And the first word he mentioned is, uh, how would you like to fly for Palestine? I got the phone call from Schwimmer when he said, uh, I understand you're looking for a flying job. I said, no, I'm not. He says, well, we have your papers that say that you are. I said, well, it depends on who I'm flying for. We came to the conclusion that we would uh, uh, buy a fleet of uh, transport aircraft. It turned out that there were a lot of aircraft going surplus by the military, which you bought for very little above scrap value. Scrap was going about three cents a pound, aluminum, you name it, so this might have been going for 10 cents a pound. So uh, we bought the aircraft at bid, sealed bid, 10 C-46s and uh, three Constellations. The Constellations cost us $15,000 a piece, and the C-46s were $5,000 a piece. How we recruited people, there was one instance where we stole the New York Air National Guard roster. And I was assigned, I was assigned, I was assigned to go down, to the, go down the list and find Jewish sounding names. We couldn't use high airline standards at that time. As long as a fellow can take off and land safely, 
It didn't have to be a polished airline type. The base uh, chaplain rabbi of the uh, West Point was also the chaplain of the veterans hospital that fa my father was in. And one day, he came to me and said, I've been collecting guns to send to Israel for the Haganah. Can you bring them down to New York? We had an office at 250 West 57th Street called Service Airways. I didn't know what it was. It was an outfit called Service Airways on the door. Yehuda Razi came in one night. There was a man there dressed in some sort of an oddball military uniform. We assembled all of our pilots at the time and uh, air crew, uh, and as many as we had on the East Coast. And he drew the shades and he told us, gentlemen, Welcome to the Haganah. The Haganah is the defense force uh, of Israel. That was my first indication or realization that, uh, you know, this was uh, an Israeli effort, and this was for real. The program that was adopted by the headquarters of the Haganah and approved by Ben-Gurion and supported very much throughout the War of Independence was consisted of three stages of operation. Total mobilization of everything we had in the country, the aircraft, the manpower, the few pilots we had. Second stage, which was to be performed in parallel with the first one, was to stop purchasing all available aircraft, mostly war surplus, everywhere in the world, and see if we can devise ways by which they can be brought closer to the country. Number three was to start training Israelis, but we knew the time was not available anymore. Therefore, we had to mobilize volunteers abroad. I like to fly, of course, and this offered an opportunity to fly. I couldn't get a job with the airlines because I was a Jew. I don't care what anybody says. That was the way it was in 1947, 1946. Young men who had fought in the American Air Force, Jews, were willing not only to go and collect money and send money to Israel, but to risk their lives and some of them lost their lives uh, in the process, as you very well know. They were an extraordinary crowd of people. There were a few Gentiles amongst them as well, who were moved by our effort to establish an independent Jewish state and to join us in that effort. You're not Jewish, are you? No, I'm, uh, How come? I'm going. You're going. <laughs> tell, tell us about it. No, okay. well, uh, That's very exceptional. Yeah, well, well, actually, uh, I'd seen Dachau, and uh, I didn't like it. Israel was the underdog, and uh, I'm being an Irish background, and we always, if it's an underground, and let's face it, uh, we're trying to make up for some of the faults of the Christian world of what had happened before, because in 1945, I was at Bergen-Belsen. Most of the guys had uh, some little thing going uh, for them. They were fed up with their job. They didn't have a job. They were fed up with their wives. They had just left their wives. They just got thrown out. I think we're all a little... My sugar, you know. We had recruited about a thousand men, roughly 300 from Canada, about 700 from the States, and a handful from Latin America. We had to evade the strict restriction against the exporting of heavy aircraft. It was against the law to ship anything to Israel, thanks to President Truman. President Truman had declared an embargo on all arms and munitions of war, which included even a bolt for a, a wheel or a tire or a tube for a wheel of a Piper Cub, needed a munitions control board export license. And that was effective April 1348. We were very problem? much worried about the FBI. We changed our hotels every night. We uh, phoned from uh, space stations and not from a definite telephone. There was an embargo and we shipped arms and we uh, sent uh, people to fight in uh, a foreign country. All this was against the law. The FBI and, uh, and the Treasury Department were very much uh, after us at this time. Everything we did, they always arrived, but they always arrived late, after. To circumvent a United States embargo on the export of heavy aircraft, an agreement was concluded with the Panamanian government to create an international airline called Lineas Arias de Panama. Overnight, Al Schwimmer's airplanes became the official certificated airline of Panama, LAPSA, which, in reality, was the embryonic Israeli Air Force. The C-46s flew down to Mexico City. The Constellation flew nonstop to Panama. 
We lost one of the C-46s, as I've stated before, in Mexico City. Gershon was the only one we really lost in the operation there. I was the first to take off. I think Ribikov took af off after me, and Bill Gerson was the third. Apparently, Gerson tried to stay in the air on one engine, and she flipped right over. And he and Wilson, his mechanic, got killed. Gerson was recruited by Sam Lewis and myself. Sam Lewis knew him for some years. We just took him away. He left his field, left his wife, left his home. That was the, the infectious nature of the whole operation. People became enthused and committed by the very nature of seeing all these young people dedicated to the job they're doing. The situation to get the airplanes out was very, very uh, delicate, shall we say. And so what happened is we had these airplanes down in Panama, and these were the Panamanian airline run by the Arias family down there. And they couldn't understand why the hell weren't we, we had the airplanes, why were we flying places already, you know? Why were all these airplanes down there with all these guys and everything, with the mechanics? We were getting close to the, uh, to the time in, uh, in May when the intelligence said that on the declaration of the independence of the state of Israel, uh, Israel was to be invaded by armies on three sides. The Arias family were very suspicious about it, so they put a, a military guard around the one constellation. One night we were called into a meeting, and uh, I don't remember who it was, but this guy said, all right, all this crap of seas, we're going to Israel now. We ran like thieves, and we jumped into the airplane, the Constellation, with our 14 mechanics, one with a wife, and we ground up this, and we took off, you know, without any permission whatsoever. From Panama, nine C-46s in one constellation flew to Natal, Brazil, and then across the South Atlantic to Africa, to Italy, and then on to Czechoslovakia, where an understanding had been reached between the Israelis and the Czechs for the purchase of irony of ironies, Messerschmitt fighters. The Messerschmitts there were in various states of uh, construction, parts, assembly, and so forth. So we had a base at Zatish, near Bruno, north of, uh, north of Prague, uh, where we then had a complete assembly, testing, and so forth. With the Russians, you know, watching, and uh, with the Czechs cooperating, and with the cash payment in dollars. In January 48, I was sent from Zagana to, to Czechoslovakia, to Zatic, to be the commander of the airport there, to uh, absorb all the planes coming from the uh, United States, and to organize the field to send the, the rifles and the spare parts and the, and the planes to Israel. From the Czech base, codenamed Zebra, they dismantled the Messerschmitts and loaded them aboard their transports, along with guns and ammunition, and flew this desperately needed cargo across the Mediterranean to Israel. The famous Biza machine gun, which uh, was one of the important elements that helped to break the uh, blockade of Jerusalem, uh, which was a Czech machine gun, was brought to Israel by the Constellation. These crates of Biza machine guns and ammunition, which to this day I feel is so timely that without those Bezas, the war might have turned out to be a little bit differently. Landed there in Ekron, or Akir, as we used to call it, getting there about 2 o'clock in the morning, have the fantastic greeting there by the, the, the guys there, the people there. They all came down to the airplane with their trucks. They all helped unload the bees and machine guns. The hunger, the excitement, machine guns with ammunition. It was really a glorious moment because we really weren't there very long, I think about two hours. And in two hours, we refueled and we had to leave again. The next morning, I heard we had the great battle the machine guns turned the enemy away. Without the aircraft there, God knows how that country would have survived today. Because this is the, the aircraft that brought the guns in. Lots of guns, lots of check guns, lots of ammo. The Messerschmitts, assigned to the 101 Squadron, aptly named since it was Israel's one and only fighter squadron, arrived in the nick of time. On their very first mission, May 29, 1948, four Messerschmitts, now with the Star of David on their wings, attacked and repulsed an Egyptian armored column less than 30 miles north of Tel Aviv. It was the uh, culmination of all our dreams to finally fly, so to speak, under our own flag with the Magen David on the wings. 
in a few minutes, we were over Ishdod, and I looked down, and wherever I looked, there were uh, the soldiers, the Egyptian soldiers. There must have been 800 vehicles and maybe 10,000 troops, like ants all over. And I uh, pushed the nose down, and uh, I was right over the square, which was filled with soldiers, and uh, we attacked. At the moment uh, that we attacked, the uh, whole place erupted with anti-aircraft fire. I guess everybody there, all 10,000 of them, were shooting at us with whatever they had. It was a great sensation. We were finally hitting back. I was not aware at the time that Eddie Cohn was uh, hit and uh, crashed. That evening, our uh, people intercepted a radio message from the commander of the Egyptian forces. And I'll never forget it. It said, we were heavily attacked by enemy aircraft and we were scattering. And they never moved one inch forward. My first uh, arrival in Israel, I crashed. Well, when we arrived over Israel, it was completely socked in, fogged in. So I called the crew in the cockpit. There were four of us. And I said, well, these are our options. We're all in this together. What do we do? Take a shot at it. Try to make the landing. So I made six passes. And I kept on getting lower, and I finally hit the ground. And uh, the navigator, who was a kid from the Bronx, uh, Mo Rosenbaum, I had instructed the crew to stand, stay in the, in the uh, cockpit. And he uh, got so scared uh, watching these approaches that he, he left the cockpit to sit in the cabin. And uh, of course, when we hit the cargo shifted, moved forward, and crushed him. I was not uh, stunned in the crash. And the first thing I remember uh, was my co-pilot shaking me. He said, come on, get out, get out. We're on fire. And uh, I went to bail out of the side window. And I, I couldn't move. And I figured, holy mackerel, my back is broken. <laughs> what it was, I'd forgotten to untie my safety belt, you know. So I untied the safety belt, jumped out helped my co-pilot out. And of course, everything was burning, you know. And we were, it was foggy. And I, everything was illuminated only by the light of the fire. And I said, come on, let's get the hell out of here. This thing is going to blow up, because we had bombs and stuff. And we started to walk away from the plane. And uh, we heard this moaning from the aircraft. and. Uh, so the co-pilot said, come on, we got to go back. Eddie is still in there. It was our radio operator. So I went back to the window. He said, I can't move. You know, I have a broken leg. And he said, well, I'm not coming in there after you. You better get over here. So we crawled over to the window. And Eddie Stirak, who was not Jewish, by the way, he's Polish, um, he crawled over to the window. And he, he, he's about six foot four, and he weighed about 250 pounds. And I picked him up like a baby. And, you know, drag him through this window. And I said to Eddie, I've got to put you down. I can't carry anymore. I carried him about a mile. And he said, don't leave me here. The arms will get me to cut my nuts off. <laughs> I said, just lay down there and keep quiet. And we walked right into the field. And I had a broken nose and a bunch of bones in my face, broken and burnt arms, burnt face, burnt hair. But uh, I was alive. And I, it was very funny. I says, well. I remember saying to myself, my God, I got away with this one. I'm never going to get in a plane again. <laughs> About a week later, I was back flying again. The C-46, originally designed to ferry supplies over the hump to China in World War II, was never intended to function as a bomber. But it did, and well. C-46s, night after night after night, dropping bombs with bomb chuckers. These were young cadets who had the job of taking the wheelbarrow to the edge. When he saw the green light, they threw out the bombs. The bomb chuckers were a wonderful bunch of guys. They were all volunteers. They had no, no experience yeah. in doing a thing like this. And also, you had a guy who, who was in the door of the, of the aircraft there. And he had his back to the, to the wind, but he had a, like a window washers 
uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, harness. Put a harness on there, and he had his legs spread apart, and they took the, the bombs, and he pushed them between his legs, and he had to pull these two tags. I'd like to see you do that thing when the airplane is going pitching back and forth, trying to evade, you know, the lights and trying to evade whatever uh, anti-aircraft. One Chochem, one of the young kids, didn't like leaning out in a wind blast at 150 miles an hour and pulling the pins out. He decided to pull the pins out while the bombs were in the airplane. And while rolling to the edge, one bomb rolled off and started to roll, roll to the back of the airplane. It hit sideways with a active pin, not safety. So you can imagine had that not hit sideways, I wouldn't be here to tell a tale. Simultaneously, uh, while we're engaged in using live bombs to create havoc and to be more effective, well, we had cases and cases of uh, pop bottles, beer bottles, that we'd also throw out by the case. And uh, the theory was that at terminal velocity from 10,000 feet, these beer bottles made so much noise, the whistle sound, and then the crash, that the civil population would panic and get on the roads and hinder the progress of the Egyptian army. The effect was devastating. As they said in those days, a hell of a way to fight a war. But it did the job. It held the line until the real bombers could be obtained. B-17s, four of them, purchased war surplus by Al Schwimmer. Three of the bombers reached the check base of Zebra and then continued on to Israel. Eli Cohen, a navigator, will never forget his first flight in one of the B-17s. 15,000 feet over the Atlantic, stepping over a plexiglass floor window, he fell through the floor. I was out of the airplane from just below my shoulders. The only part of me that was in the airplane was my head and the very top of my shoulders. In falling through, I had also rubbed myself and would go along the crazed glass and I was having internal bleeding. The pilot and the crew co-pilot were back here the radio men were back here, and the rest of the crew were back in here. When I began yelling, and when this tremendous high whistle of the rush of the wind coming through the cracked plexiglass was there, nobody heard us. And it took a number of minutes before he was rescued, and he was hanging out over the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I am the only one that I know who has ever survived this type of a thing. The fourth B-17, flown by veteran Captain Irvin Schindler, got no further than the Azores. They had seized the crew and held them under arrest at the airport. The aircraft was seized. Subsequently, the crew went back to stand trial in New York. Schindler was very lucky. There was a nice judge who gave him a suspended sentence, a little probation, and that was the end of it. The rest were left, let off because they were unknowing, you know, volunteers. But the airplane was lost. The three B-17s that did reach Israel, however, made their presence known to the enemy from the very start. Being ferried in from Czechoslovakia, one bombed Cairo. The other two hit Gaza and El Arish. From that day on, no Egyptian bomber ever again appeared over an Israeli city. Uh, we took off on the morning of July the 15th, uh, three B-17s. Uh, one B-17 was to go to uh, over and bomb Cairo. Uh, I was on that airplane. And the other two were uh, scheduled to go to uh, El Arish. When we got to El Arish, it was dusk. We could see the airfield, but not well enough, not clearly enough, so it was decided not to, not to bomb them. I said, there's uh, uh, Gaza. So we bombed them. The raid was organized so that the other two of us would bomb my, uh, El Arish or Gaza as a diversionary flight about five minutes before the high altitude B-17 bombed Cairo. And then we came up uh, 25,000 feet and we were coming over Cairo. And at our altitude, it was just dusk. And we could see all the lights. Cairo was lit up brilliantly. Our aiming point was King Farouk's palace. Uh, four bombs fell in front and eight bombs fell behind it. The first squadron commander was the Ray Kurtz. Ray couldn't stand cold water. If you took him in a swimming pool, it had to be lukewarm. As it turned out later, after the War of Independence, Ray Kurtz met a icy, watery grave off of Greenland, completely disappearing. One of the uh, raids that I remember, our plane was finished being refueled and bombed, and uh, we had no place to go, and uh, 
I said, well, gee, we got this plane. What are we going to do? And one of the crew members said, uh, Hal, he says, uh, let's bomb Damascus. I said, hey, that's a good idea. We took off unescorted, flew at altitude, uh, 10 or 15,000 feet, I don't recall, bombed the airport at Damascus. And then uh, we could see the explosion. I don't know how much damage we did because we had mostly Second World War leftovers from the Luftwaffe. And then we came back on the deck. And on the way back, we uh, came across this uh, big uh, supply column that was headed into Israel. And uh, I know that we tore up and down with, the, with all the gunners shooting at whatever they could see on the ground. And later on, we were told that we had broken up a big invasion force of Syrians. The thing that impressed me most about the whole thing is it was rather informal, you know? <laughs> there were really no, I mean, you wanted to go bomb, so you went to bomb. Hank Greenspun, who was a World War II U.S. Army major, landed on the Normandy beach in 1948, was drafted by Al Schwimmer into the Haganah. Sent to Hawaii to inspect war surplus aircraft parts, he found a treasure trove of machine guns and aircraft engines. In crates labeled agricultural implements, he smuggled this vital cargo from Hawaii to Mexico, where he obtained an additional supply of guns and ammunition. There, in Mexico, he succeeded in loading this entire cargo aboard a freighter. All of a sudden, the phone rings. It's Teddy Kolick and Eliyahu Sakharov on the other phone. They're calling from New York. I says, Teddy, the ship has gone. I says, I, says, I forgot to call you. We had a code name. As soon as a ship, because every day they call, BG says, BG says, this ship must come. Ben Gurion says, the ship is gone. It sailed at sunset this morning. Teddy says, Hank, you can't imagine how important this ship is. It must go. I says, the ship is gone. It's gone, Teddy. And they both started to cry. And I started to cry at the other end. <laughs> The three of us are crying on a telephone. He says, you're positive. I says, Teddy, the ship is gone. Notify them. Notify BG that the ship is gone. Well, believe me, if you wrote a scenario for a picture, you couldn't do it better. We were out of fuel for that evening's flight, and a little chap, Peter Barr, was then in supply service for the Ministry of Defense, who himself went to Haifa to meet the boat from Veracruz, to unload the first drums of fuel onto certain trucks to take them ahead of the unloading to Ekron to fuel that night's flights. Otherwise, we were grounded. No bombing, no airlift. And it brought all, brought all the spare engines and spare parts and whatnot that were needed to operate the C-46s. And the ship brought about 2,000 tons of uh, aircraft bombs and ammunition and whatnot. They took everything off the ship that could move, that could fly, and they put it on anything. And they swept into the Negev. The Negev, the arid, inhospitable desert in southern Israel that encompassed nearly three quarters of the territory allocated to the new state, the very heart of the nation. In September 1948, the Egyptian army pushing into the Negev threatened to overwhelm a besieged Palmach Brigade and thereby split the entire country in two. The air transport unit was asked to prepare a plan to airlift supplies and soldiers. It was impossible, impractical, and unthinkable, and therefore could be done. And it was. In a period of about two months, transported up to 100 tons a night, we changed 5,000 men in the Army. Some of them have never been on an airplane in their life before, except seeing one. Now you're flying them down in the negative and leaving them down in the enemy country, you know, cut off by Majdal and Fallujah down in their first time in combat, or, or going to face combat, and you bring it back, these young kids, these Palmachniks, full of life and enthusiasm. They were boys and girls. You couldn't tell the difference. They were kids. We were taking wounded back to Tel Aviv, and they were all refugees who had come off the Cyprus and so forth, all spoke Yiddish. There was one young man who we had on a stretcher. In order to get him onto the C-46, he had to be lifted onto a jeep and so forth, which moved him quite a bit and was painful for the wounded. And he, I heard him sobbing, and I went over to him. I said, don't worry, it'll just take a few minutes, and we'll have you on the plane. You'll half hour, you'll be in Tel Aviv. The doctors will take care of everything. He said, don't think I'm not crying because of my pain. I have lots of pain. He said, but that's not why I'm crying. 
He says, it wasn't so long ago, I didn't know if I would survive day to day. I didn't know if I'd be alive. He said, and to think that I would have the opportunity to fight for Medinat Yisrael, that I could fight for Israel, and if I were wounded, I would be flying out of here in a Jewish plane with Jewish pilots. He says, I'm crying because I survived and because Israel survives. The war raged on. Slowly, ever so slowly, the enemy was pushed back, helped no little by the replacement of the dangerously unreliable Messerschmitts with the acquisition of new, far more efficient fighter planes. The Messerschmitt was our first fighter aeroplane. We had a lot of problems with the Messerschmitt because of the landing gear and because of the engines, and many of those aeroplanes were damaged and broken, uh, just a normal flying. Luckily for us, uh, we managed to buy uh, Spitfires. Spitfires, sold to Israel by the Czechs and flown to Israel via Yugoslavia in another impossible operation, Velveeta. I was asked to plan Velveta, the uh, uh, flying of the Spitfires from Yugoslavia to Israel. So we decided to take six of those planes, take out the radios, take out everything, strip it completely bare, if you remember, mm -hmm. put gas tanks, it was literally a flying bomb, and try to get six over land, past Turkey, past Greece, hopefully get through and make a landing. Sam Pomeran made a new design and uh, installed the extra wing tanks and extra tanks uh, by uh, replacing the radio. We had replaced the uh, pilot seats with rubber fuel tanks that Sam Pomeran had set up and designed because these airplanes, these Spitfires, were going to go nonstop to Israel, never done in history. And uh, we did that, we took off, and we would, on the DC-4, were flying just as fast as we possibly could in safety and the Spitfires were flying alongside of us just as slow as they could. We were their navigators and they sat behind us, throttled back, so that they wouldn't wind up over you know, Egypt. When we left Czechoslovakia, we had Yugoslavian colors on the plane. And then we got the Ugo, we took, washed them off and put the Israeli. The word was if we were knocked down or we forced down, they ask you who we are, we're Yugoslavians, right? Right. He lands in Yugoslavia, the farmers take him, they want to kill him, they put him in the jail, and when they, the policemen come and they interview him, they say, who are you? He says, I'm a Yugoslavian. He says, talk Yugoslavian, I can't. <laughs> the day we landed, 22nd December, 1948, the next day, Spitfires, the same Spitfires took part in the big uh, kick of the Egyptians out of the Sinai. And that was a big contribution to the success and to the, uh, uh, to the end of the war. Sidney Cohn, South Africa, he was our commanding officer after Muddy Alon died. Sid Cohn being the natural leader that he was, he became it. Rudy, one of, one of the, uh, the stars of the squadron. I have uh, four confirmed kills. I uh, shot down two Spitfires, uh, uh, one Fiat and one Dakota. All the, uh, and all the planes uh, were Egyptians. Five British aircraft were shot down that day. We don't know exactly how, uh, who shot which ones down, but definitely five. When they shot down the five aircraft that day, he was one of the four. And they came down, a guy by the name of Sudden Death Schroeder flew one mission, shot down one airplane, and went home. And went home. <laughs> he got the name Sudden Death Schroeder. Yeah. In, that in that flight was another guy, Arnie Rook from South Africa, tremendous sense of humor. So when they talked to Sudden Death, they asked him why I shot down one aircraft. I think Azer was in the flight too. What happened to you? I think I damaged one. Came to the other guy, I forgot. But when it came to Arnie Rook, they said, Arnie, what did you get? He says, I got an awful fright. <laughs> Across the Atlantic in America, Eleanor Rudnick donated her talents in her airfield, establishing a training site for the first 13 Israeli Air Force aviation cadets. Eleanor Rudnick was a uh, family friend of mine. And I knew that she had uh, bought a lot of aircraft post-war surplus, had a little airfield in Bakersfield that she owned. I went up there to talk to her and convinced her that she should I flew up in my little green bomber, I call it the Cessna, and convinced her that she should help us. 
Leo Gardner and Sam Lewis and Al Schwimmer, and, uh, they were the people that I had a lot to do with. They all told me that, to, you know, that I was going to be visited by somebody to see if I could make the course. This little fella showed up. Moshe Gorin, he's the one that I made the deal with. When he arrived to me to talk, uh, I didn't want anybody to know us or to recognize him or see him for anything, so I put him in the airplane. I had a Navy on. I said, come on, we'll talk in the airplane, and I flew him over California. We made all the plan for everything, and, uh, and, and everything was just the way the two of us talked it out. I had uh, working for me um, already uh, some uh, ex-U.S. Air Force uh, instructors. The students were real sharp. They studied their paperwork. They knew all, all the answers that we uh, uh, were required of them. I mean, they, uh, they, they did all the ground school work real good. I don't think uh, they had any problem with fear or anything. We call them the Palestine Indians at the time. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> That's why, we, you know, we didn't know much about Israel or anything else. They used to go fly over Shafter and buzz and created quite a uh, lot of uh, excitement over there and until I got a phone call from the local sheriff and uh, he called me up one day and uh, he said, you better control your Mexicans. He said, they're scaring the people over in Shafter. They didn't speak English. They were talking in gibberish all the time, you know. It was Hebrew and... Uh, uh, they people asked me, uh, who, what, what kind of people are they? And I said, well, I got me a contract from the Mexicans. So they all called them Mexicans. Was Eleanor a good pilot? Uh, yeah, she was a good pilot. I mean, uh, uh, to me, girls can't fly worth a darn anyhow. <laughs> uh, I remember there was two, uh, two girls, I think, at one time. Yeah. And uh, how did they do? One got killed in a crash during the war. One was killed, huh? When they completed the course, I gave them, I don't know whether it was a certificate or and some kind of a badge. Or, I told them to be at my parents' house at 11 o'clock because I had it all arranged that they would leave town. I, there was something happening that the FBI was starting to uh, bother people in, in other towns, starting to make connections, and I wanted them to be able to get out of the country. So there was an arrangement made to fly them out, and... Uh, I didn't get bothered until, I think, a, at least a year later. Hotel 14 in New York, that was our headquarters. On 57th Street, we also had offices. That was a more open place because you're allowed there. 14 was the tough stuff. That's when we had to get, we got tips where planes were, where guns were, where ammunition was, you know. And we used to get that at 14. That was Colic's headquarters. He was really the head of the Haganah in the United States. Anytime we were in trouble or needed anything, we always ran to the Hotel 14. And Tully Colic would say, he's a nice, good-looking guy, good personality, skinny. We were much more fearful of the arm of law those days. We were brought up that way. We were, had respect for the cops. We had great respect for under the other organizations, the FBI, for instance. We were worried that the FBI had picked us up in Los Angeles, that they were following us to uh, New York. So when we'd arrive in New York, you know, we'd take a cab and we'd jump out of the cab, get into a subway, and we'd go to 60th Street, come up one side, go down the other side, and then go to 72nd Street and grab a cab and come back to the Hotel 14. We knew that the FBI were following us, what we were doing in New York. In fact, we were on the 10th, had an office on the 10th floor of 250 West 57th Street, and right across the way was another office with a camera in there shooting pictures of we people in that office, trying to get evidence on us. What happened was I got a phone call from the sheriff, and he said, uh, you're going to have a visitor about your Mexicans. Next day, here comes this nice guy, and he gives me his uh, badge, and he says, uh, he starts asking me a lot of questions. And then I went and got me a lawyer. Hell, I was going to be cremated. I was going to be put in jail. I was a young girl. I could see myself spending years in, in, a, in a jail with uh, all kinds of people. And, and, and I didn't know what, what would I be, a, a, like a, a Ripley. 20 years later, I would come back into the world. What would it be like? 
I didn't, I didn't want to sacrifice my freedom. She had to sit in court for nine whole months and was found guilty. I spent an hour in jail. I got my fingerprints. I got a record. And she suffered dearly. I don't think we protected her enough. I had to do what I thought should be done to save people's lives and to save their, their souls. The, they'd been butchered. They'd been mistreated in Europe. They were still, some of them, in concentration camps, not allowed to come out. It was a terrible, terrible, terrible thing within me because I was very nationalistic USA, but I, I was also Jewish. And, uh, and, and, and people, my own blood relatives, I found out had been butchered by those bastards, those uh, Germans. And, and I just, God damn it, I, I, I was prepared to, and, and I, I tell you this now, and I know it was then that I had decided, I evaluated it, and I, I, I decided that if I, in the course of doing my work, whatever I was asked to do, that if I was asked to commit murder on someone, I would also do it. In the late fall of 1948, through the efforts and sacrifices of all involved, Israelis and foreigners, Jews and Gentiles, the war was nearing a successful conclusion. The contribution of the Mahal uh, pilot who came to Israel to fight with us and uh, helped us very much. In fact, they were the only pilots except for two or three Israeli pilots like Ezer Weizmann and Modi Alon that uh, joined the squadron. They came from uh, the United States, from South Africa, from England, from Canada, and uh, their help was very, very essential. And uh, I would say that uh, without them, uh, probably our uh, situation in the war would have been very, very uh, difficult. The beginning of uh, the War of Independence, the Egyptian Air Force controlled the skies. When they came, the tide was turned in our favor. Therefore, I believe that first and foremost, it was a significant military contribution to the fighting of Israel at the War of Independence that was the longest and the most painful war that we have ever experienced. But for some volunteers, it was not quite over. A number of them returning home to America were accused of a variety of Neutrality Act violations, indicted and put on trial. There were uh, 22 or 23 of us uh, that were charged in the uh, federal court with illegal export uh, and breaking the U.S. illegal export to the Middle East and breaking the U.S. Neutrality Act. This is the first time in the history of the United States, which has a, had a neutrality law for 200 years, it's the first time they ever brought anybody to trial. There was a bitterness, sort of an act of vengeance against most of us. I don't think the trial was necessary. I believe we weren't really guilty of any harm to the United States. All we did, we took airplanes out of this country that the United States was selling for junk. They didn't want them. And for this, they prosecuted us and persecuted us for nine months. Of those brought to trial, the only criminal to serve a jail sentence was ironically a Gentile, Charles Winters. Years later, his deathbed request to be buried in Israel was granted. And there was yet another righteous Gentile, fighter pilot Wayne Peake, who asked to be, and indeed was, buried in Israel. So, after nearly 40 years, the contribution of these foreign volunteers was finally recognized. I believe that Israel is very thankful to them for what they have done, for the, what they showed by their volunteering. Israel does, never owed me anything, but I owe Israel a debt of gratitude and that what we did, we did with love and that we owe. Since Israel was created, since it became a state, we all walk with our heads high. The commander of today's Israeli Air Force honored some of the surviving pilots. And to all the volunteers, 
I would like to present a memento to mark the contribution of each and every one back in 48. We don't need overseas pilots. We don't even need Jewish pilots. What we need is Israeli pilots. And it was on this base that we got the, the first four pilots who got their wings, and I was very happy to play a part in it. It's been my privilege, what can I tell you? It caught me just right. I was in the right place at the right time with the right background, and it was a privilege, and I'm really most thankful. If it weren't mainly for the expertise from the American Machal boys, Israel may not have been realized. We had to go Mr. Aaron and do something Finkel. because of what had happened in World War II. I just couldn't understand uh, how the Jew was so mistreated. And so many millions of people were killed. I had to do something. And this was my opportunity to help do something. And I was just a small cog because there's so many other guys uh, did, their, did their thing but did it the hard way and never came back, you know. So whatever I did uh, was for the sake of a, of a nation and I would do it over again. It was one of the finer parts of my life. It was probably <laughs> the only basically unselfish, idealistic thing I've ever done. This particular period in my life is the most important period I can remember. And I think it was the making of something that inspires me constantly. I am forever indebted to the opportunity of having contributed in small, in one small way to the creation of Israel. They were all intent on one purpose, and that was to est help establish that state. And we achieved that, and it was a, it's a very proud moment. Our contribution allowed uh, the Jews to walk around with their head up a little more and have a little more respect. There are Americans, and on the law of return, we're also Israelis. Two of the greatest democracies in the world we belong to. We're better off than you Israelis. <laughs> <laughs>